All right, good evening, everyone. And welcome to How to Pray, uh, session eight. Um, and I pray it's been a very fruitful journey. So uh, we have here the uh, class attendance sheet. So just check off if you're here. And if you're new, just write your name in. Let us know that you're with us. I'll start it off with Roger again. Yeah, I know. Roger just said we are all here, but we're not all there, <laughs> which could very, you know, could be very possible on a Wednesday night in the middle of a week. But it seems like I am, so that's good. <laughs> One thing I'd like to encourage the class to do. Uh, which I've been encouraging the class to do since the, you know, since about the fifth class is to pray through scripture. And uh, each time I do want to set an example and to help us be able to do that, feel more comfortable doing that. Uh, and one of the easiest ways to do that is not just using the Psalms, but using the, the epistles, Paul's epistles. Because at the beginning of most of his epistles, he includes a prayer. He has a prayer for the church. And so if we pray after his prayer to God, we know according to his will. It's pretty, pretty amazing to pray that way. And um, so tonight, I do want to pray in chapter 1, a portion of it. Um, in Colossians chapter 1, Paul has an amazing prayer for the church. Uh, starting from verse 9, going to verse 14. And so because of that, I do want to pray through that as a class and just ask for God's blessing um, using this portion of Scripture here. Once again, that's Colossians chapter 1, and I will start with verse 9. Okay, let's pray for our time together. Let's pray. Father, what a great joy and honor it is to come before you tonight and long for you together. Um, what a beautiful thing it is for your church to gather together, to hear from your word, uh, to hear from your voice, and to learn from you how better to speak with you, how better to communicate with you. And Lord, tonight we pray for your help. We pray for your presence. And um, we want to pray with this in mind, that we may be filled with the knowledge of your will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Because, Father, we want to walk in a manner worthy of you, fully pleasing to you, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of you. So we pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us with all power, according to your glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, helping us to give thanks to you, Father, because you qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. You have delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of your beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And it is of your Son that we speak tonight. It's of your Son that we want to learn about tonight. Uh, we pray that you would grow us in the knowledge of God. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Um, all right. Here. We have lesson two, and we're going to speak tonight mostly about the glory of the one who teaches us how to pray. In other words, the glory of Jesus Christ. And how does that inform the way that we pray. Last week, uh, if you remember, we dealt with the authority of Jesus Christ, like the preeminent authority, and how he spoke with such incredible authority, even saying, well, the law says this, God's law says this, but I say, and so he was amplifying it and, and treating it as if he had authority even over God's law. Um, he, he spoke as only God could speak, and his enemies understood that, and they said, uh, wow, this guy's blaspheming, you know? <laughs> this guy, how in the world can he say these things? Unless, of course, he is God. And so last week, that's what we were thinking upon, that 
that Jesus, the one who teaches us to pray, this Jesus, the one who speaks with incredible authority. And uh, tonight, we're going to speak about his glory a bit. Can we uh, look at the lesson aims for, for the beginning here? The lesson aims tonight is I want to begin to understand the significance of one event that really changed three of the apostles' lives. It's called the Transfiguration. We left off with that in Matthew 17 last week, and I want to pick up there. Second, I want to gain a slightly better understanding of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What does that phrase, what does that mean? And... Uh, and finally, we want to explore how then understanding the glory of Jesus Christ, His authority and His glory as God, informs how we should pray. Um, hmm, and that is, that is a lofty task, really, one that we really do need God's help for. Uh, thing I want to touch upon before we jump in. Last week we had an amazing question. We had a great question about the Trinity and prayer. Now, I'm preparing a little bit of a study on that, which we will get into next week. And uh, it's rich. It's so rich that I'm so excited. I almost feel like jumping into it tonight, but I can't jump into it too much. But I do want to jump into it a little bit before we jump into this. And that means that let's go to Ephesians 2 for a second. I want to look at one verse and then unpack it for us in order to help us think about how our understanding of the Trinity informs the way that we pray. Um, Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians as a book is a beautiful, like, it's a beautiful teaching, has lots of beautiful teaching on the Trinity and how the Trinity informs church practice and how we should live as Christians. Um, it's an incredible Trinitarian book in a lot of ways, and I'm, I'm going to point that out next week. But for today, just one um, just, just one verse, and that is chapter 2, verse 18. In chapter 2, verse 18, we have a biblical summation of what happens when we pray. And it, it's so short, it's a short phrase, that I, I, a short sentence, uh, so short, in fact, that you can gloss over it. But I want to unpack it a little bit. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18, we have this. It says, for through him, that's through Jesus. We have, we both, uh, this is we both being a Jew and Gentile, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So you see that the Trinity is in this verse. We have through Jesus to the Father in one spirit. This is exciting to me because... It's one of those things where I go, our, our theology will not just inform the way we pray, but it should comfort us in the way we pray. I think Jesus, okay, if I think of prayer, what's going on? Jesus taught us to pray to the Father, and thus I, I believe that it's biblical that most of our prayer should be directed to the Father. Not that it's wrong to, to direct your prayer to Jesus. I could say, thank you, Jesus, right? Like, throughout my day, thank you, Jesus, for this, or thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Um, it's not wrong to say those things. It's not wrong to pray those things. I'm maintaining, though, the teaching that Jesus taught us to, to pray to the Father. But it says, pray to the Father through Him, through the Son, we have access. So, Jesus provides the basis for my prayer before God. Without Him, I have no basis to come before God because I'm a sinner and He is perfect. He's holy. He's separate from me. So there's a sense in which I can't approach God as a sinner unless I go through Jesus. He is the mediator. He is the basis. That's the word I want to have in our minds tonight, the basis. So on the basis of Jesus, what is, what is the result that comes out of that basis? I want to say it's confidence. Confidence. We'll, 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 un, we'll unpack this next week. I have a lot of verses, especially out of Hebrews, to talk about the confidence and boldness that we have before God because Jesus is our mediator. So we have, Jesus is the basis for our prayer, the only reason why we can come before God in prayer because he, he eliminates that barrier of sin that separates us from God. 
So he is the basis that gives us confidence. So B, C, basis for confidence. And then what about the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit, I want us to think also B, C. The Holy Spirit is our backing for comfort. Um, the, the Holy Spirit is called the Comforter, the Great Comforter in Scripture. And what He does, though, is that when we're praying to the Spirit, we are relying upon the Holy Spirit to help us pray to God. Because not only does the Holy Spirit help us in our prayers when we're praying, but He is the one who gives us the desire to pray in the first place. So if there's a desire in your heart as a Christian to pray to God, that's, that, that is initiated by the Holy Spirit in the first place. So there is a comfort that comes when I'm relying upon Him, knowing that God is present with me as I pray to God. So there's no separation there. It should be intimacy. Um, when I'm thinking the results, so the results here are confidence and comfort when I come to God in prayer. There shouldn't be a separation of, oh my goodness, I've got to work through all this stuff. I've got to become a certain kind of person before I can approach God. Because the basis is already fixed. It's Jesus. And the comfort is also fixed. It's the Holy Spirit. And so when, when I think about that, the Trinity really comforts me when I pray. Um, it's not something that I try to work through theologically um, or try to kind of lock into place in my theology before I can pray. I just remember that, wow, Prayer is such a beautiful thing. I have, the, I have the confidence that comes in Christ that I can come before God, that He hears me. And then I have the comfort that comes from the Holy Spirit that God is present with me as I pray to Him. And He's helping me to pray. Um, and that, that is a little bit of what we're going to get next week in terms of the Trinity and prayer. But I wanted to touch upon that tonight. And that's in this verse. That's what we're talking about when I say we pray through the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit to the Father. It's a, it's a beautiful picture uh, of what prayer, of what's going on when you pray. Now, do you have to realize what's going on every time you pray? No. But I think that that's, that's the, me the mechanism. That's what's going on when you're praying, you know, as a child of God. And it's good to realize this. It's just precious to realize this, that I, I have confidence um, and I have comfort because the Trinity is, is operating and as, as I'm praying. Um, it's a beautiful thing. All right, that said, let's go to the beginning of our syllabus here into Matthew chapter 17. Now in Matthew 17, something huge occurs that is it's so big that that this, that this happens, and it's hard to uh, explain the magnitude of how different the lives of three disciples are going to be. Um, we're talking about Peter, James, and John, and they are the only three witnesses of what occurs on this mountain when Jesus takes them up. Now, Jesus is about to show them something that they will never, ever forget. Uh, remember last week we talked about Jesus' authority, and we also talked about the end here of chapter 16. Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That's an incredible... and You're going to find your life. That's, who can say that? but God. And so he says at the end here, truly I say to you, there are some standing here, and he's talking about Peter, James, and John. There will be some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. There's, there's a glory that they're about to behold, and chapter 17 is all about that. Here we go. After six days, Jesus took with him three, Peter, James, and John. His uh, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And this is where the Greek kind of, like language kind of fails to tell what's going on here. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Now, what happened in this moment? You know, when Jesus became a man, he had to veil his glory. Being God, see God face to face in his light, in his glory, you die. It's just that powerful. It's that kind of intense. This is where Jesus 
moment strips off that veil for a second to give his disciples a glimpse of what he is, who he is, of what he is, that he's God. And he, he, he is transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. So uh, you, you always tell kids, don't look at the sun. It's, there's a good reason for it, you know? It damages you. It's so bright. Like, ah! And, and I didn't listen to my parents. I looked at the sun and look, I'm wearing glasses now. Uh, not that, I don't know if that really has a correlation, but I'm saying it's not good to look at the sun. It's so bright. And here, his clothes became white as light. So we're not talking about blanched white. We're not talking about some sort of white linen. We're talking about light itself. Piercing light. You close your eyes and it's so bright. That type of thing, right? Now, he is showing them something that is so powerful about his glory. That this is who I am. And they were so astonished, right? They, were, they just kind of got flabbergasted. Um, and not only that, but look at verse 3. This is even, oh my goodness. Behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah. Him. So all of a sudden, two of the greatest prophets in Israel's history are they're, they're talking to Jesus. Uh, I, I can't imagine being there, you know? Can you imagine just standing there, being one of Peter, James, or John, and just going like, oh, wow, what's going on? And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, we will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And, you know, big mouth Peter has to speak up because he's totally, he's like so nervous. And you can tell when Peter gets nervous, he just talks. Like he's that kind of person. Um, and in, in John, you'll, you'll get the commentary on that because John actually will say he did not know what he was saying. <laughs> So Peter is just speaking out of his mouth, and, and he, has, he has no idea what's going on. And uh, while he's still speaking in verse 5, Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud. This is the Father. He says, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces, terrified. It's a normal reaction when God shows up. Oh my goodness, it's God. Well, they fall to their faces. But Jesus came and touched them. What a great mediator, right? Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. I'm here. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now this, imagine being one of the three disciples, okay? Could you, like, I don't know how you could have a normal conversation with Jesus again after this experience. I mean, if I were Peter, James, and John, you're walking along the street, you'd be like, I'd be looking at him again and looking at him again and going like, I, I saw him in his light. How, how, what do you talk about then? Do you talk about the weather? Like, what do you talk about to Jesus? He showed his glory to them. His glory that he had with the Father before the foundation of the world. And it changed them entirely. Um, it changed Peter for sure. I want to look at this in 2 Peter chapter 1. Can we turn there? to 2 Peter chapter 1. Now, 2 Peter is what they call Peter's death row opinion because he's about to die and he knows it. And when you're about to die, what do you talk about? You talk about what's most important to you if you get the chance. And here, Peter is talking about what's most important to him. Now, what is it that he wants to mention at the beginning of this letter that's most important to him? It's the transfiguration. Look at chapter 1, verse 16. Verse 16. This is Peter about to die, telling you what's on the forefront of his mind. And he says, in verse 16 of chapter 1, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves, and he was there, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. See here at the end of his life? It's fixed the transfiguration. Because in that moment he saw the glory of the Son. He saw Jesus as God. And it was like, wow, it's a huge 
So here at the end of his life, he still can't get over it, right? He's still like, wow, I saw him in his glory. That is a terrible, I mean, thing that it changes the life here. Uh, so what of the glory of God? Let's, 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 let's trace this a little bit in Scripture here. Um, Mark 8. Can we go there? I think it's in the syllabus. Mark 8. This is the very first time that Jesus will speak about the glory of God. Is in chapter 8, verse 8. Jesus uh, revealed progressively to the disciples the truth. It wasn't He didn't like... You know, floor them with the truth all at once. He he was very wise about what he could say to people at certain times, and here at this stage he decides to mention the glory of God for the first time in their relationship here, or at least the first time recorded in Scripture here. Uh, Mark chapter eight verse thirty-eight. He says, and 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 look at the close connection between the glory of God and the identity of Jesus. Because look, in verse 30, he says, Whoever is ashamed of me, of me, not of God, but of me, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him, the Son of Man, also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father, holy angels. Remember last week we looked at the angels? How Jesus didn't, post he didn't call off the angels. He postponed them till the final judgment. That's what's going on here about the final judgment, I'm going to come back with God's glory. And on that day, you'll see me. Um, and on that day, there will be those that he'll be ashamed of, and there will be those that he's not ashamed of. Um, that's the first mention, though, of the glory of God. And then look, the very next thing, chapter 9. He said to them, truly I say to you, this, does this sound familiar? There are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And right after that in verse 2, the transfiguration. So once again, we have a pattern. He just mentions the glory of God. We have um, him mentioning the kingdom of God coming with power. And then we have the transfiguration, which is a, 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 an instance where we get to see what a glimpse of the kingdom would be like, where the king is robed in incredible majesty and light. It's a charge statement. Now, if you, I mean, if Jesus said, uh, you know, some is sitting in this room will not die before they see the kingdom of God come with power, how many of us would raise our hands? I certainly would raise my hand. Like, oh my goodness, please God, show me. I want to see the glory of God. I want to see the kingdom come with power right now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of how the disciples, I think, would have felt. Because they were expecting the kingdom to come right then. Jesus, he had, a, he had a different plan. He knew that the kingdom was not imminent, that it wasn't going to come right then. That there was, in fact, going to be at least 2,000 years now before the kingdom comes with full power. And here, though, it's hard to know what to pray for. Because you'll see James and John. We're about to look at James and John and a request they make to Jesus based on the fact that they wanted the kingdom to come now. They wanted the glory now. But here, okay, so we have the transfiguration in Mark 9, verses 2 to 8. Uh, we already walked through it in Matthew, so I'm not going to walk through this again here. But look at, um, oh, Mark 9, 9. Mark 9, 9. Uh, chapter 9, verse 9. As they were coming down the mountain... Okay, this is going to be a really hard request for Jesus to make of those three disciples. Jesus charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So it wasn't even until after Jesus had resurrected the disciples would have told anyone about this transfiguration. It was just that big a deal, you know? It's also, I don't know how many people would have believed them anyways, <laughs> but I would have felt like telling everyone, I just saw God. <laughs> In his glory, unveiled. It's crazy. I saw the kingdom. No, he, he says, look, don't, don't say anything about this until the right time. Um, all right, now, we're not going to talk about Peter so much. We looked at what Peter thought. What about James and John? What are they going to do with this information of the glory of Jesus that they saw? Well, we'll see right here in Matthew 19. Matthew 
Matthew chapter 19, starting from verse 27. Actually, uh, I want to start looking at the context of what's going on here, starting in chapter 19, verse 16 to 26. Um, this is good to set up. Uh, it's, it's good to understand the context. Verse 16 says, Behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This gives the law, uh, part of the Ten Commandments, having to do with just interpersonal relationships. Notice, he didn't talk about the First and Second Commandment yet. He's talking about interpersonal relationships. And this guy, the young man, said to him, all these I have kept. Now that's, that's an incredible statement to be able to make. I don't know if this guy was being honest or he was self-deceived or what's going on. But he goes, all right, you, you those are the requirements, I've kept those. What do I still lack? And so Jesus now touches upon what are the first parts of the Ten Commandments. But he makes them about himself. He says this, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Jesus hits kind of on the nerve. He knows this guy's rich. He knows this guy has idols all over his house, uh, little, little possess possessions that are ruling his life. And Jesus goes, repent, kill them, come after me. And look at the response. It's so tragic. In verse 22, the young man heard this and he went away sorrowful. He went away. So he walked away from God. Like he walked away from God because he just would not do that. He would not let go of that which owned him, which were his possessions. His possessions. So he, it said, for he had great possessions. So that was the reason why he walked away. I, I can't follow you. I can't give that up. And uh, Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And then, when the disciples heard this, of course, they were greatly astonished. Greatly astonished. Amazed. They, they were out of their minds, like, crazy thought. Like, because, first of all, culture, they did, just as we do in our culture, I think, they viewed people with wealth as being blessed by God. Like, this rich young ruler is closer to God than I am. Poor fisherman, and he owns so much possession. So where would that come from other than God? And so God is blessing him. Jesus kind of turns that on its head, doesn't he? It, it's crazy. Like, for them to think this, it's like a total culture shock. Like, what? What? Not wealth? Not prosperity? What's going on? And so they, they, they heard this. It says they were greatly astonished, and they said, who then can be saved? They're like, what? This is impossible then. No one can be saved. No one can go to heaven. And then Jesus looked at them and gives them these comforting words. He says, With man this is possible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, and this is the same Peter that saw the transfiguration. So think about that in terms of a man who saw the transfiguration. Jesus, uh, Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? What will we have? And Jesus said to them, Truly, I say to you, in the world, man will sit on his glorious throne. In the Greek, it's actually more specific. On his throne of glory. So he mentions glory there. The glory of God. And that which you saw, Peter, on the mountain. So Peter, like right now, I'm thinking, like, fireworks are going off in his head. Throne of glory, the kingdom, Transfiguration? Okay, I'm putting it together. And here, Jesus says to him, In the new world, when I sit on my throne of glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now that is a great promise. If I were a disciple at that point, I'd be like, Yeah, 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 yeah. I love it. That's so great. And then he says, And everyone. Okay, so he just he doesn't talk about the disciples. He's talking about all the, all the disciples. You and me now. Everyone who has left houses, 
or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake. In other words, it's not about having possessions and giving them to the poor as much as it is following after Jesus, right? Following after him for his sake, doing all things for his sake, giving up whatever it is for his sake that he's asking for. Uh, then they will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But he says, many who are first will be last and the last will be first. So in the end, the economy of the world is going to turn head down. Because really what matter is what is done for us. That is the true treasure. Um, whether, like whether or not you followed him. Now that, that is uh, the eye of the needle. You walk through is the kind of thing where it's impossible with man, but with God, it's possible. With Jesus' blood, it's possible. That type of thing. Um, and that's what's going on here. In a parallel passage, this is exactly kind of the same moment. This is going to be dealt with in Mark as well. And I want to point this out. Look at Mark chapter 10. It's in your syllabus, I think. Mark chapter 10. In Mark chapter 10, verse 35, verse 35, we have James and John. Now, these two brothers went to the mountain and they saw the transfiguration. So we have to also realize that that's what's going on here. When Jesus mentions these things, sure, they could not have but thought of the transfiguration. Now here, in Mark chapter 10, verse 35, they, uh, this is near that same moment, what's going on in Matthew. Jesus is going to mention his glory again, and James and John have a request. It says, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the ones who saw the transfiguration, they came up to him and they said, We want to do for us whatever we ask of you. That's a bold request. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. The glory that we saw on the mountain. Like, the, a glimpse of that. When you come into your glory, because we understand your glory better than the other disciples did. We actually saw it. We saw part of it. So, asking him, let us see your glory. In another place, it actually also tells us that James and John had their mother ask Jesus for them. Um, when their mother asked Jesus, you know what she, she said? She doesn't say in your glory. She says, let my son sit, one on your right, one on your left, in your kingdom. Why? She wasn't there at the transfiguration. She did not see the glory, so she only knows of the kingdom. But James and John, they saw the glory, so they, they mention it and they call it the glory instead of the kingdom. Let us sit on your right and your left in your glory. This is a cool prayer, right? Like if you had the right, if you had the right to go up to Jesus and just kind of ask for anything, that's kind of a good thing to ask. Like it's, I, a lot of people fault them for being presumptuous. I kind of go, well, if I were in their place, I would do the same thing, wouldn't, wouldn't you? I'd be like, hey, 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 I have a chance to get ahead with the king. You know, Jesus, please, let me sit on your right hand. And they're thinking riches and honor. They're thinking, you know, they're thinking massive glory, the thing that we saw on the mountain type of stuff. And look at what Jesus said to them. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Very often, I think, in our prayers, we do not know what we're asking for. Like, we, have, we don't know what it entails when we're asking God for certain things. And this is what's going on here. He says, you don't know what you're praying for. You don't know what you're asking. He says, are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? Now, the, the, this is a metaphor, you know, right? It's not a literal cup. We're talking about the cross. He's about to suffer and go to the cross. So he says, I'm about to drink this cup of God's wrath. In the Old Testament, they, they make reference to this cup of God's wrath, that God's going to make the nations drink out of his anger. And Jesus says, I'm going to drink that cup, but for believers' sake. I'm going to drink that cup so that some can be saved. And here, he says, I'm going I'm to take this cup, and I'm going to drink it, and I'm going to be baptized. So there's an active part. Jesus takes the active. I'm going to take this cup actively, drink it. The second one is, though, I'm going to be baptized. That's the passive part. I'm going to endure 
this situation that's going to come at me, all these this anger and spitting and the cross, these, these things that people are going to perpetrate against me, there's a baptism to be baptized with. So there's a passive and there's an active. And Jesus, this is what's mind-blowing to me, is that Jesus applies it to James and John here. He says, are you ready? So in other words, are you, are, would you be willing to follow me if this is what's going to happen to me? Now, they don't know anything about what he's saying because he's kind of veiling it from them, isn't he? He's not saying, are you ready to endure the cross? Like, he's not saying that. He's, he's calling it the cup and he's calling it a baptism. So they're like, ooh, okay. And in verse 39, they say to him, we are able. Now, that's a huge statement that is said completely out of ignorance. Like, they have no idea what, what they're about to be up against. But they say, we are able, and here's what makes me shiver, is that the last part of the verse, Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. And then he says, but to sit at my right hand or my left, not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Now, if I were James and John, I'd be deflated here, right? Oh, you... You say that we're actually going to go through your cup and your baptism, but you say that it's not yours to grant whether I can sit at your right hand and your left in the kingdom. So like, oh no, like I don't know if I even got my request. You know, it's kind of, ugh, I'd feel deflated. And look, uh, and not only that, not only would they be deflated, but they would be a little bit, like, a little bit sheepish now because look at verse 41. When the ten heard it, this is the ten, including Peter now. Peter was at the transfiguration, so he would have been livid. Uh, when the ten heard it, <laughs> uh, they began to be indignant at James and John. Now, that makes perfect sense, right? If you were the other disciples, you'd be like, come on, guys, like, you said that to Jesus? Like, you made that request and tried to get behind our backs to, like, get ahead in the kingdom? Come on, you guys. Like, they, they, so there's jealousy, there's all this anger up among the apostles, and Jesus called them to him, and this is what he says to them. You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, that that other, other kings love to oppress those under them, and that their great ones exercise authority over them. But, verse 43, it shall not be so among you. But whoever will be great among you must be your servant. So once again, flipping it, right? Last will be first, first last. You flip all the world's morals on its head. You, you, just because you have authority doesn't mean you can lord it over people. In fact, it's the opposite. If you are in authority, you serve is what Jesus is saying. You must be your servant, and whoever would be first of slave of all. For even the Son of Man, so even I, the Son of God, the, the Messiah, came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life, his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus gives himself as the ultimate example of what it means to be part of the kingdom of glory. It's not what you think it is. It's not trying to get ahead and trying to lord it over the others like James and John were trying to do with the other disciples. But it's in fact moving lower, making yourself a slave, making yourself a servant for others. So once again, you see, like I think at least two cases where Jesus' values completely dash to pieces our expectations. The first one is, wow, Jesus, your glory is so wonderful. Let's have it now. And then Jesus says, well, what if it involves great suffering, a cup and a baptism, right? Are you willing to go through with that for me? And then he says to them, you will go through with that. That's scary stuff. Secondly is, well, what, what does it mean to be great in the kingdom? What does it mean to have that glory, to be part of that glory? It doesn't mean that you're all raised up and you get to exercise authority over lots of people. It's because you actually get lower um, and, you, and you become a slave of all. That's how you become great in the kingdom. I've, I've heard before people that love John Calvin and love like Martin Luther, they go like, wow, Martin Luther and John Calvin are probably going to sit on huge thrones in the kingdom. They're going to sit on these like jeweled, like golden thrones. And I, I, I don't think so. I think that Martin Luther and John Calvin would probably be the guys that are sitting on the stool, but they are the happiest. They're just sitting on a footstool and they'd be so happy because they're actually in the kingdom. You know, like that would be the right attitude, I think, to have as a servant of God. And so that, that's very challenging, I think, to us in terms of understanding, first of all, the glory of God, how great that is and how much we want it, but then the process 
by which God often goes to get there is not what we expect. It involves a cup, which is an active embracing of denying yourself, taking up your cross, following Him. And then it involves a baptism, which is taking the circumstances of your life, right, with that faith in mind, knowing that you're enduring this because you're a servant of Christ and, uh, and growing you in faith. Like, I want to point out, like, one thing here. Um, can we go to 2 Corinthians? This has been really encouraging me, so I hope it encourages you here in 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 9, there's an amazing statement by the apostles. They, they really learned this, this, uh, this lesson of that the glory comes after suffering. It comes after the after the Here, um, in chapter 1, verse 9. Listen to what is said here, and then I want to unpack it a little bit. In 2 Corinthians 1, 9, it says, Indeed, this is Paul speaking from his own experience, Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. Now, what would it take in your life for you to honestly say that, right? Like, that I felt that I had received the sentence of death from God, the death penalty from God. But, he gives the purpose for that. But, that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. That is an incredible statement of one who understands what it means to drink the cup and to be baptized with a baptism. Because here, suffering is intense to the point where I despaired of life. I thought I was going to die, as Paul's was saying. I thought I was dead, a dead man. But all this happened to me, why? So that I would not rely on myself but I would rely upon the one who raises the dead. In other words, the one who I can have faith in even if I had died. Because he is my hope even beyond death. He is my hope to raise me from the dead. So that, 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 that blows my mind to think that God uses death to magnify his glory. That God uses death even in our lives to show that our trust must not be in this life, but it must be in the one who raises the dead. What great glory, what great power. Now here, here uh, that, that's, that's kind of what I have for us tonight. Does, does that make sense? We have the glory of God, we have uh, this, this teaching from Jesus that although James and John wanted the glory right away, Jesus says, look, God's process is very different and probably not wanted by you. It involves a cup which is an active embrace of, of this suffering that comes to a believer's life, and also a baptism, which is also a, a passive, a passive um, kind of endurance of the things uh, that come at you. Even in death, it's so that God would have us not on ourselves, but on the one who is on Him. And And in prayer, I mean, I can't, I can't kind of apply all of it in terms of what our prayer should look like because of that, but do you see how that affects the way that we pray? Um, not for riches, not for possessions, not for stuff. I think that, that makes sense of all the New Testament passages where it says, pray for endurance and patience. <laughs> like, pray for the ability to drink the cup, to accept the baptism. We don't have to drink the cup that Jesus drank, right? That's not what he is saying. He's like, you're not going to endure a cross that Jesus endured. That, the fact is that he was the only one who could endure that. But as his followers, he was also saying, this is also for you. This is what's coming to you. Um, can we turn finally here to Philippians? Philippians uh, chapter 1. We'll close with this here. Philippians chapter 1. Mm. Verse 29. This is a, a verse that I call meat. Like this is a verse that I think is
maybe even over uh, chapter 1, verse 29 says this, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not him, but also suffer for his sake. That it's in the purpose of God, not only that we would believe in Christ, but that suffering would have a purpose, that suffering would be to the glory of God in our lives for Christ's sake. Um, that reminds me of like Peter and, and you know, when, when, <laughs> when he got beat up by the elders after preaching the gospel in the streets, uh, he, he left the, the prison and he didn't leave morose. He didn't leave angry or unhappy. He actually left singing because he was counted worthy, it says, to suffer for Christ's sake. Hmm. That does also turn our values, I think, on its head. Now, like, how about you? I mean, how much are you valuing the glory of God? And, and how much are you looking forward to seeing your Savior one day in that glory that we've seen in the transfiguration today? But then also, uh, there's question number three here. Are you willing to follow in Jesus' footsteps, even if it involves drinking a cup of self-denial and being baptized in the baptism of suffering that is like His? A disciple must become like his master to be called a disciple. Now these kinds of things, once again, um, you know, this is preliminary. We haven't even gotten into the prayer yet, haven't we? So next week we actually enter into the prayer with our Father. Um, but this is to set us up kind of with um, the sense of Jesus. Who is this one who teaches us to pray? He is the one who has awesome authority from last week. He is the one with unparalleled glory. But he also has very sobering teaching, right, for his disciples. That a disciple's life does involve a cup, does involve a baptism. Uh, we have a few more minutes. Uh, are there questions, comments, cheap shots, outbursts of anger, songs of praise, songs of lament, um, deep prayers for me? I don't know. Is there anything? Thank you for hanging with me tonight, class. <laughs> yes. I'll make later. Sure. Uh, like uh, in the Catholic Church, they, they pray to Mary. Mm -hmm. And uh, they say that uh, Mary uh, was like a sainted body and soul. And I just wonder, you know how like in the Bible, and no one ever really touches that other than that religion. <laughs> I know, isn't it is strange. I do think that it is strange that the Catholics pray to Mary because there's nothing in the Bible that would teach us to do that. There's a lot in the Bible that would in indicate that that is wrong to do. Um, I think it's something to do with the fact that they accept as their authority not just the Bible but the tradition. And so when a pope, I think one of the popes way back when uh, made this tradition and then it's, it's kind of come down to us. I think it's been extremely damaging. Um, because, first of all, it, it turns Mary into some sort of deity. Um, you only pray to God, you know? And, and also, I think it, the presupposition is wrong because um, the, it presupposes that God is either angry with me or that I can't go to Him. I need to go through somebody like Mary uh, to be merciful, like that Mary is the merciful one and that God is somehow the, the smiting, judgmental one. I don't like that picture. Now, I know that I have a lot of Catholic friends, so I know that there are Catholic friends that disagree with me on that entirely, that think that, um, no, that's not like it at all, right? But I just, I feel like that's where your thought is going when you pray like that. And it's also not the way Jesus taught us to pray, you know? So I just, I just don't like moving away from what Jesus taught us. Yeah? Can I add something? Sure. Mm -hmm. and, and they do, they do, um, I mean, in Mary's prayer, after she's told that she's going to bear the Messiah, she says that my soul give th gives thanks to God, my Savior. And uh, she herself went to God. 
And I think we should follow her example. We should go to God, you know? I, I think that there's uh, been a very bad severing of a right view of God because of different ways that we pray. Um, the way I was describing tonight and that I'll flesh out more next week, I think is the best way to maintain a right view of God when we pray. Because I think our view of God changes the way we pray. You know, that's, that's the premise of this whole class. Um, but I don't, like, I don't want us to ever think that we can't go to God, right? He should be the first place we go, even as we sin. He should be the first one we go to. Like Adam and Eve, they, the first thing they did was hide, right, after they sinned. Like, God, oh no, God. Actually, we should run to Him. He's the only hope we've got, you know? So I want to encourage that in, in this class. Mm. As the mother of Jesus. And, but we also teach that sin separates us from God. Mm -hmm. I never felt that I could not pray to Jesus, that I could not pray to God the Father. Mm. And we are supposed to go to God the Father in a way that Yeshua is the one that reconciles us. But I did go through that when I realized. My sin, I think each and every one of us feels that way, but if we're born again, we know that He will never leave us nor forsake us, and we believe in each of us, and we know that we're born again. Mm -hmm. So we are reconciled, and we be reconciled. Mm -hmm. So I think we all feel that we cannot go to God, but we all feel that type of inferiority. Yes. Mm. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I think it, we, we must maintain that Jesus is the only reason we have confidence, like the only basis for our coming before God. Um, I, I, I've heard my Catholic, friend, Catholic friends call Mary the mediatrix before, and I don't know where they got that, because to call Mary a mediatrix, in other words, she is a mediator to God, as Jesus is a mediator to God. So there's two of them. Like, like the Mary helps us and Jesus helps us. I just, that, that would be blasphemous, I think, just against Jesus. Like I, I think they think that because she was carrying his womb, she, he was carrying her womb, that she knows us the way he knows us. And it's just not, it's, that is not true. Well, I, yeah, and I, I mean, I understand that Mary was a very special woman. Like, I, I love Mary. <laughs> I think she was a great believer and that we'll see her in heaven and that we'll have a great conversation. Like, I think that Mary is an amazing woman and a humble woman. And you can tell by her prayer uh, to God. But um, she herself would be appalled that anyone would even go through her to God because she knew that she was bearing the Savior of the world. Anything else? I saw hands. No? Okay. Uh, thank you, class. Um, I, can I close us in prayer? Let's, let's close in a word of prayer. And uh, let's see here. Oh, I would love to pray uh, Psalm 124. Uh, I would love to pray this. So let's pray. Um, close our time. Father, thank you for um, being with us tonight, uh, that we get to look at your word, that reflect upon the glory that Jesus revealed to his disciples, but also the, the way, the importance of what it, it means to bear the name of a disciple of Christ. That the, the road to glory does involve suffering. It was that way your son can't expect any different from us. Um, Lord, and we, we ask then that you would strengthen us with the power to endure and be patient and to hope in you in all circumstances. Because if it had not been you who was on our side, not been you, uh, when, when others would rise up against us, be opposed, when, when we'd be swallowed up alive, when the flood would have swept us away, when the torrent would have gone over us, when the raging waters would have gone over us, we would have died, but you are our life. 
Blessed be you, Lord, who has not given us his prey. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers, because our help is you, Lord, you who made heaven and earth. And Lord, um, remind us again of the confidence that we have to come before you because of Jesus Christ and the comfort that we have before you because of the Holy Spirit. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone.